knows how you come across somebody once in a while you, you shouldn't have messed with. That's me. Well, I, won't back down. I am not an African American. You're Oreo cookie. White on the inside and black on the outside. I don't have an afro. I have an Amerifro. Talking that idiotic stuff you talk about, I will slap you. Go ahead. Make my day. Black as the ace of spades, but 100, 100% American. Heard around the world by everybody and their mama. The Jesse Lee Peterson Radio Show. Good morning and welcome to the show. It's an honor to introduce you to my guest and for me to uh, talk to him, Dr. Ben Carson, professor of neurosurgery, plastic surgery, oncology. Uh, He is um, a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civil honor in America. He is the author of five best-selling books including his newest book, the one that we're going to be talking about today, America the Beautiful, Rediscovering What Made This Nation Great. Dr. Carson, good morning, sir. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you. Reading your book and and learning about you, you are an amazing guy. Um, How did you get started in life? How did you get on this mission of doing what you knew you were created to, to do in life? Well, you know, things didn't start out all that great. You know, my parents got divorced early on. Uh, my mother was uh, from the South, as was from my father. She she was one of uh, dozens of children. <laughs> he was one of 14 children. Wow. And uh, she discovered after they moved to Detroit that he was a bigamist, had another family. And uh, so that resulted in the divorce. She only had a third grade education, and she had the responsibility of trying to raise myself and my brother in inner city Detroit. So uh, that was obviously not going to be a very easy task for her. Right. She worked uh, two to three jobs at a time as a domestic because, you know, she didn't want to be on welfare. Even though she only had a third grade education, she was very observant. My mother was, and she, she said she never saw anybody go on welfare and then come off of it. So she just didn't <laughs> want to go on it and start with. She That's said, right. I'll work as hard as I have to in order to, to be able to control my own life. And you know, as difficult a life as she had, she also never became a victim. You know, wow. uh, she never felt sorry for herself, and and I think that was a great thing. She never felt sorry for us either. That wasn't so good. <laughs> you know, we, there was never any excuse we could come up with that was good enough. She would always say, "Do you have a brain?" And if the answer was yes, then she said, "Then you could have thought your way out of it." There it doesn't matter what Joe or Susan or Roger or anybody else did. And you know, after when somebody won't accept your excuses, pretty soon you stop looking for excuses. That's you start right. looking for solutions, and I, I think that was probably one of the real keys for me. Now, you know, I was a horrible student to start with, uh, bottom of the class, thought I was stupid. Everybody else thought I was stupid. They all called me dummy. I was the butt of all the jokes about anybody being stupid. Mm. But, uh, you know, my my mother again came to the rescue there because uh, she worked in the homes of, of wealthy people and she was observant, as I said before, and she noticed that they didn't spend a lot of time watching TV, but they spent a lot of time reading books. And, you know, after praying to God for wisdom, she just came up with the ideal. She'd turn off the TV, and she said, you guys got to read books. Yeah. And to make sure we did, she said, you got to submit to me two written book reports every week from the Detroit Public Library. And... Uh, you know, that obviously was not something that met with a great deal of uh, enthusiasm yeah. by myself <laughs> or my brother. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but but we had to do it because back in those days, you know, you had to do what your parents told you. There was no social psychologist standing there saying, let the kid express himself. So, you know, we had to do it. And um, I really hated it in the beginning. But after after a few weeks, I actually began to enjoy reading those books because... Uh, we were desperately poor. We never had money for anything. You know, if we could go to the fair, uh, we might be able to scrape a, enough money to get in, but never enough to buy any cotton candy or take any rides. Right. But, but uh, between the covers of those books, I could go anywhere. I could be anybody. I could do anything. And and I started reading about people of accomplishment. And, you know, I had a an aha.
aha moment because it it became clear to me that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. Yes, sir. It's it's not somebody else. Yeah. It's not the environment. And uh, I said, you know what? I can change my circumstances. I can do whatever I want. And I began to read voraciously at that point. And in the space of a year and a half, I went from the bottom of the class to the top of the class, much to the consternation of all those kids who used to call me dummy. Now they were coming to me to get the solutions. But, uh, you know, it, it, it had a profound effect on the way that I began to think about myself and it began the way I began to think about my potential. Right on. And, 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 and that's one of the reasons that I devote, you know, so much time and energy and money now to, to trying to get young people from all backgrounds in our country to rec- recognize the importance of education. It is really the key factor. Is that and, what is that what the uh, Carson Scholar Fund is all about? Yeah, that's what it's about. We we take kids, you know, from all backgrounds, and we try to put the ones who achieve at the highest academic levels and demonstrate humanitarian qualities. They have to show that they care about other people. We try to put them on the same kind of pedestal as we do the all-state basketball player and all-state wrestler. Now, I don't have anything against sports. Right. Or entertainment, to be honest with you. But, you know, we put so much emphasis on those things. And, you know, we talk about education, but we don't put a lot of emphasis on it. We don't show the kids a lot of love who achieve at those high levels. In many cases, you know, they're seen as nerds and geeks and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So, you know, we're trying to change that whole dynamic. And many teachers have told us when we put a scholar in their classroom, the GPA of the whole class goes up, sometimes by as much as a whole point over the next year. But there's another they, issue for black kids who work hard in today's America they are deemed white. Uh, other kids tell them that they're acting white. And so a lot of kids are afraid to express or do their best because they can't handle that pressure. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, I, you know, I used to get that, too. They would say, you know, you're trying to act white. And I would say, well, if being smart is <laughs> acting white, what is being black? And they would never <laughs> have an answer for that, of course. <laughs> I want to ask you, you talk about are we a Judeo-Christian nation or not, and your answer to that is what? Uh, Yeah, and and this is one of the problems. People don't know our history. They need to go back and read the writings of those people who founded this nation. They were profoundly spiritual people who had a very deep knowledge uh, of the Scriptures, and uh, of Judeo-Christian values. And, you know, one of the reasons we're having so much conflict in our society right now is that, you know, there is a faction that pretty much wants to take all of that value system and chuck it and say, you know, that really doesn't have any relevance. So that sets up sort of a natural conflict. But, uh, you know, the way I look at it, what we should be doing is saying to each his own. So if you want to believe in God, you want to believe in biblical values, you're free to do that. That was the whole purpose of freedom of religion and freedom of expression, freedom of conscience. That was a huge part of the founding of this nation. And, you know, here we now find ourselves today in a situation where, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the president of of Chick-fil-A, you know, states what his personal values are, and people are trying to punish him for that. This is so far afield from what the original intention of our nation was, and it should alarm everyone tremendously. Doctor, let me take a quick break. We'll come back and tell the folks how to get this great, great book and help out your foundation as well. 888-775-3773. When we come back, from the bottom of the hour break, I'm going to tell you about my trip to Alabama, the family reunion. It was more than a notion. 
I'm looking at my Facebook comments here, and from Herman Bradley, he says of my guest, Dr. Ben Carson, what an inspirational life story of perseverance and following God's lead in one's life. I have read his story, Gifted Hands, and I am currently reading his latest book, America the Beautiful. If only his message would resonate across our land. Dr. Ben Carson is with me now. America the Beautiful, rediscovering what made this nation great. Uh, Dr. Carson, I, I agree with my uh, Herman Bradley on my Facebook comments in that if the country, everybody and their mama can read your books or hear your message, we can turn this country around almost overnight. Well, you know, and people need to understand that this this is a great nation. Yeah. You know, we we spend a lot of time bashing it and talking about how horrible we are and things that we've done. But, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. And the question is, can you learn from those mistakes, and can you move forward, or must you dwell on them and uh, and just continue to deteriorate? And, you know, there's so many wonderful things. For instance, you know, who is always first in line in the world when there's a disaster to give people relief? Yeah, we are. America, that's right. Tremendously generous individuals. And most people will be surprised to know that America actually inspired socialism. Because the Europeans looked over here, and they saw the Fords and the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Mellons, the Kelloggs, all these people with all this money, the Vanderbilts. They say, and then you've got the masses of people who don't have a lot of money. That's not a fair and equitable system. You've got to have an overarching government that receives the funding and redistributes it. Well, what they didn't understand is that America was different. All of those names that I just gave of very wealthy people, instead of being like the wealthy people in Europe and hoarding money and passing it down to generation to generation, they poured enormous amounts of money into the infrastructure and developing this nation into creating factories and textile mills, uh, which created the largest, most active middle class the world has ever known, which rapidly propelled us to the top. Also, they created universities and libraries and all kinds of foundations. And, you know, that's what's fundamentally different about America. In 2009, 40 of the wealthiest families in America pledged to give away half of their wealth to charity. Go to Europe and ask the 40 wealthiest families to do that. They'll look at you like you got six heads. <laughs> it's a uniquely American phenomenon. And this is the last place on earth where we should be having class warfare. I know. It, is, it is absolutely know. absurd. It's mind-blowing. It's absolutely yeah. mind-blowing. Um you, you, I wanted to ask you this. You mentioned your father in the open of our conversation. Did you ever reconcile with your father, your dad? Uh, yes. Uh, the last time I saw my father was at my wedding. Uh, he, he's dead. Right. But, uh, you know, he was, he was a, a different kind of person, didn't necessarily share the same values that my mother had. And even though, as, as I talk about in my first book, Gifted Hands, how devastating it was when they got divorced, you know, in the long run, I came to understand that it probably worked out better for me, uh, only because, you know, he was involved in drugs and alcohol and, oh, okay. and, and women and things like that. Not that women are bad, but more than one is. <laughs> so that's a <laughs> I'm problem. Telling you. <laughs> and, and that probably would not have been, you know, the right environment for me. I understand that. Tell the folks how to get your book, America the Beautiful, Rediscovering What Made This Nation Great. Uh, well, you can get it at uh, Amazon. You can get it at Carson Scholars Fund, carsonscholars.org, Barnes & Noble, uh, most Christian bookstores. So it's widely available. We- and uh, in fact, some weeks ago, it was on the New York Times bestseller list, which my wife frequently points out to me because it's my fifth book, but it's the first one that I did with her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. It's an excellent book. I really, really love this book. Uh, there are two quick things I want to ask you about. We only have about three minutes left here. You write that there is no such thing as a free lunch, uh, referring to the health care policy. Yes. And, uh, you know, my my point being, first of all, you know, we spend twice as much per capita on health care as the next closest nation, and yet we have these horrible access problems. And, And a large part of it has to do with enormous inefficiency. 
you know, if you get an appendectomy in Detroit versus uh, Trenton, New Jersey versus Miami versus Dallas, different costs, different ways of submitting bills, different ways of collecting, all of which justifies the mountains of paper and the armies of people to push them around, which sucks out one-third of the health care dollar. We can easily correct that by uh, unifying billing and collection procedures utilizing the ICD-9 codes, which are diagnosis codes, CPT codes, which are procedure codes, and computers. That's just one thing. You know, in the book, on the chapter on Is Healthcare Right?, I go through a whole litany yeah. of things that we can do, which will drastically reduce the cost which will make it possible for people to own their own health insurance. If you own your own health insurance, I can say, if you get an annual physical, you get a 3% discount. You're incentivized to do that. I catch things much earlier. We begin to emphasize wellness, not sickness. We look at preventive health care. There's a whole host of things I think should have been done. Uh, and un- unfortunately, with uh, you know, people maybe met well with the health care reform, but you really need to get people doing this who know about it. Yeah. You know, if yeah. the if the if the uh, San Francisco bridge fell down, who would you get to rebuild it? People who like to talk about building bridges <laughs> or structural engineers. You know, <laughs> well, healthcare is just as important as that. That's we need to right. Deal with it the right way. Um, a uh, short answer to this question because of time here. I could go on and on with you. You talk about human nature. Why can we not peacefully coexist? Why can't we? Because, you know, people so often uh, listen to their baser instincts. Yeah. And, you know, that appeals to superiority and putting somebody else down uh, so that you can feel better about yourself. And, you know, the, the only the best way around that is leadership. And that's something that that we've been lacking for a while in this country. We need inspirational leadership that appeals to the higher instincts in people, not the basis instincts, which divide and make people into enemies. Dr. Ben Carson, you are a blessed man. You have children? I do. I have three sons, uh, an engineer, a vice president of a financial firm, and an accountant. Well, they're fortunate to have you as a father, and we're fortunate to have you in our great nation. Thank you for coming on, and uh, I absolutely appreciate your book. Well, thank you very much, and may God bless you. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye now. Amazing book, America the Beautiful, Rediscovering What Made This Nation Great. And just FYI, just in case you couldn't tell, he's a black man who loved this great nation because he was influenced in the right manner by his mother. Isn't that amazing? 888-775-3773, 888-77-JESSE. When I come back, we're going to take some calls, and I'm going to tell you about my trip to Alabama. This has been the Jesse Lee Peterson Radio Show, produced by Bond Action. To access the full version of this show, visit us on the web at bondaction.org.